uh, STD Prevention Science Series of 2017. As you know, these series are put together by It gives me tremendous pleasure today to introduce to you Dr. Paul Sandstrom, who is the um, director of the HIV and uh, retrovirology um, laboratories uh, in Canada. He works for the federal government in Canada, like we do in the United States. He's also the um, head of the microbiology laboratory. So you have a confusing kind of setup there. But he belongs with the um, Public Health Agency of Canada. As well, he belongs with the University of Manitoba. He has a very um, kind of here, there history. He graduated uh, in Winnipeg with his degree. And then uh, he was in North Carolina for a while. Uh, well, no, he was also doing a postdoctoral uh, research in uh, Winnipeg. And then he was at CDC between 1993 and 2002. Is that right? And then he went for a year or two uh, to Ottawa, Canada, to kind of set straight the retrovirology lab there. Apparently, Harold Jaffe, who Paul was working with at the time, asked him to go to Canada and do this job. How many years ago was that? He's still there. But from Ottawa, they moved. They are in currently moving the laboratory to Winnipeg. That's how come he's associated with the University of Manitoba all over again. And that's how I met him uh, over the years. Paul is a prolific scientist. He has many publications. He has done uh, amazing work uh, on HIV and on Ebola. And I didn't know about this, but he participated in the Canadian response to the Ebola crisis in West Africa, deployed to, on three occasions uh, to uh, Sierra Leone and Guinea, work, working with Doctors Without Borders. Apparently, uh, regulation of tumor progression by the immune system was the subject matter of his postdoctoral research. I had a very interesting conversation with Paul at lunch today where he explained to me how what he was doing then and what he is being done today are very different because science has grown by leaps and bounds. I'm, I think you have seen all of the write-up about Paul. I'm not going to take up any more of your time. Paul, it's all yours. We are delighted to have you here. So it's, it's great to be back in, uh, in Atlanta. Um, as, uh, as, you know, as was mentioned, I was here from, um, from 1993, and technically I only say I was here until 2002, although I was actually on interchange during that period. I think Carol just wanted to get rid of me and send me back up to Canada. Uh, but it was definitely probably the most formative time of my career, and I look back at it, it's almost like a bit of a dream now, looking back at the time I spent here in La Atlanta, but it was uh, definitely a, a decade that I really, really cherish, and with the exception of the fact that my children are all die-hard U.S. hockey fans for the, during the Olympics, uh, everything else I think worked out pretty, pretty well. <laughs> so what I want to speak about today is some work that we're doing, and I, wanna, I, I need to sort of validate or qualify right up front that the world of bioinformatics, it's, it's a very special world, and uh, I think we use the terminology, um, it, it, depending on who you're talking to, it's molecular epidemiology, bioinformatics, but it's basically a collection of, um, of tools that I think are rapidly becoming available um, over the past few years, driven largely by you know, exponential increases in computational capacity. There's a, um, you know, web portal facing, or public facing tools now for doing various types of phylogenetic analysis. There's also sort of this more recent innovation over the past five to eight years of next generation sequencing, 
which has lent uh, a whole new um, level of sort of insight into how genetic information can be used to sort of guide um, behavioral surveillance. And that's, I think, really the direction I'm going to be taking this talk. It's not so much about the bioinformatics piece about it, but it's more about how we're integrating, at least in our programs, integrating bioinformatics into, um, just trying to figure out how to go forward here, bioinformatics into behavioral surveillance. And so, you know, currently molecular epidemiology methods use a variety of applications, including phylogenetics or viral genealogy. And I think it's one that most, most people sort of commonly uh, understand, and that's sort of looking at within risk populations, at least in the case of sexually transmitted bloodborne infections, how uh, viruses in one population or one part of that population relate to other parts of the population. But there's also sort of more elaborate tools that have become available around phylogeography, which looks at viral dispersal within populations, and then phylodynamics, which, which will be, you know, looks at uh, the expansion of effective population sizes as well as the timing and emergence of epidemics. And so these methods are of significant utility to the larger field of epidemiology as they help to formulate hypothesis. And that's really sort of the way we look at the work we do. Is it doesn't provide, there's no aha insight moments that we ever seem to find when we start to look at the genetics of viruses and populations, but it more or less starts to formulate hypotheses which then can then feed back into the behavioral surveillance and network analysis work that's done by others. So both molecular epidemiology and behavioral surveillance uh, analysis generate essential, essential but not fully sufficient information to understand the transmission of infectious disease within, within population. But because surveillance, behavioral surveillance data deals with both the infected as well as the uninfected populations, uh, it allows for a much better understanding of the environment which supports the disease transmission and, and then that can significantly improve on the inferences that are made through molecular data. So I'm going to start with um, this slide. This is actually a shout out to the exceptional capacity that the CDC has in, in applying bioinformatics. Is there people in the room, are there bioinformaticians in the room before I put my foot in the mouth? Because I'm probably going to, I'm pro or on the phone I guess is the other question. Oh, okay. So I, I apologize if I'm about to uh, slaughter this exceptional study, but I think it really highlights the power, the current power of, of of um, molecular epidemiology. So this is a paper that was put out by my, my former supervisor, uh, Harold Jaffe, and uh, my uh, uh, a colleague and friend of mine, Wally Danini, uh, last year. And what they did, and I think this is really uh, sort of exceptional, they were able to go back and look at a hepatitis B cohort and uh, prior to the first identification of AIDS cases in, in, um, in the United States, and extract from that with some very, high, uh, very powerful uh, laboratory tools genetic information on the sequences that were circulating in the population at the time. And so a few things that come from this analysis, and this is basically a basal spatial temporal uh, reconstruction, tree reconstruction, but allows for them to uh, identify a number of key patterns which were occurring very, very early on in the epidemic, one of which was they were able to show that the, the initial transmission into North America likely came from the Caribbean and not in the other direction that it ended up in New York where there was a, an expansion of the population within New York. And then uh, as well, there was uh, sort of this, at, at early on in the identification of the outbreak, there was already significant variation occurring within, within the HIV that was circulating in North America. And I guess as a side note, um, all the, the paper does highlight that it actually, the notorious patient zero that was there by, by um, the unfortunate circumstances of a transcriptional error and his, his ability to identify his contacts in California and New York, that it shows that this individual really had no significant um, role in either seeding the epidemic or, or driving the epidemic forward in the, in the 1970s and 80s. So as a disclosure, my understanding of my mathematic comprehension is poor to um, remedial. And so things like Bayes' theorem, I have like, a, you know, I, it's about a YouTube level understanding of Bayes' theorem. But I think one of the areas that we've been able to capitalize on, and again, this is because we've been fortunate to work with a number of very good teams, is understanding how we can get, and I'm going to insult anybody who does bioinformatics, but understanding how we can get the best meat into the bioinformatics sausage grinder, okay? And I think that's really important because in the absence of really getting um, representative samplings, uh, 
uh, genetic sampling into the bioinformatics, the information that comes out is, is quite limited in, in being able to, um, basically being able to guide public health. And so the way we've done this is we've come up with a, a process that involves, and I'll go into this in more detail, but mapping of, of at-risk populations within, with, within any uh, ge geography that we've, we're working in. There's an integrated behavioral and biological surveillance component that collects a lot of the really relevant in, under, uh, information about risk behaviors and, and typologies of, of operation. We've um, pretty much universally converted over to the collection of derived blood spots, um, and that's you know it is the you know, the collection, shipping, and storage of derived blood spots is technically the simplest part of the whole pipeline. It's actually the most difficult to implement on most occasions. Um, but we so we've been sort of working on how we can effectively do that and, and get dry blood spots to a laboratory to be tested initially by serology. And then we've moved on and we've done this work in, in collaboration with others to um, be able to, there's always issues with trying to sequence out of a dry blood spot. You never get 100% just because of, of nucleic acid degradation issues. But we've come up with a number of, um, of methods that we can pretty much reliably, as long as the dry blood spot is shipped, stored, and, and, um, and collected appropriately, we can get upwards to about 90% amplification. And of course, as with a lot of other groups, we've changed over the past couple of years from the old ABI Sanger sequencing techniques to next generation sequencing. Uh, so, you know, basically this is the key to the, the whole process is how the samples are collected. And what we, and again, this is work of others, we piggyback on top of what they do. But generally speaking, what we do is if we're looking at a particular population, let's say intravenous drug users in a particular country, which we'll be do, working with Pakistan shortly, we identify the hot spots of activity basically by going into the community and identifying, and this is on sort of a level one activity, identifying where these spots exist by engaging with tertiary, secondary and tertiary informants. And so in the case of intravenous drug use, it could be former intravenous drug use or, or service delivery programs, uh, sex work, it could be taxi cab drivers. Uh, data is in, uh, there's a coalition of data that involves basically validating that the spots that have been identified by these tertiary and secondary informants are indeed true, and then these are mapped onto a map uh, to understand where they are, are located. That falls up with level two activities, which is actually going to the spots, and it varies depending on the size of the geography. It could be all spots identified or a subset of the spots identified, and doing interviews with the key informants, which are actually the most at-risk populations that are in these spots leads to uh, sort of focus group discussions so that people in, the, in these in these locales understand what's going on. And then there's a mapping of the spot, final mapping of the spots, and then we can make sure that the sampling is representative of the typology and the, um, the geography that we're looking at, amongst other things. So the um, first project I'm going to talk about is the Canada Pakistan HIV surveillance project. So I've been working in Pakistan now since about 2003. And when I first started working there, my residence was probably the nicest hotel I'd ever stayed in, uh, but then it got blown up uh, twice. And they moved me to a trailer park, a bomb-proof trailer park on the outskirts of Islamabad. So the, it's a little bit dismal even with blue sky, but it, it had one advantage is that the um, diplomatic enclave had set up a little bar about 200 meters away so I could go down there and have beer and chicken sandwiches at night. Um, and incidentally, mine is the nice one. And, out of the thick group of them. So Pakistan is an overview, and I, I don't know um, people's familiarity with Pakistan, but it's in terms of human development in DC, it's ranked very, very low. I think it's actually lower than 146 now. Second largest Muslim country in the world. It's it's um, ethnically and, and linguistically diverse. And just to sort of put, I'm sort of the guy that likes to wave my hands over the screen, but I'll do it with the curse here, just so it references. Four primary provinces in Pakistan, there's Sindh, which is down here, Punjab, which is, sort of extends up north of that. Those are the two provinces that were most involved in the uh, partitioning that took place during the de decolonialization of, of uh, British India. Then you have Baluchistan and what was formerly known as the Northwest Frontier Province, it's now uh, referred to as Kamar Pasunwa, which is our KPK for short. These are areas that the populations are primarily Pashtun and Baluch, and they identify themselves more with 
those tribal groups than they would with people living in the in the Indus Valley area of, of Punjab and Sindh. So I think this is readily apparent to everybody. Post-independent history has been marked with periods of military rule, political instability and conflict, conflict with its neighbors and conflict internally. And as much as we have a sort of, our Canada and the United States have sort of a national focus on our own um, vulnerability to terrorism, there's probably no country on earth that's been more affected by terrorism than Pakistan. So uh, this is a little bit dated, but I think it's still relatively accurate. The estimated prevalence of HIV in the general population is around 0.1%. There's probably in excess of 100,000 cases now in Pakistan. It's primarily within certain key populations. The main one is people who inject drugs and has shifted from a low prevalence to a concentrated epidemic. And this is like the, the fact of fiction, and I'll get into this a bit more as we get into the molecular epidemiology part, is it was believed that the Pakistan epidemic was founded by a single event, a migrant worker ret returning from the Gulf because he had been diagnosed as being HIV infected somewhere around 2000. Um, I don't know if that's true. I mean, when I first started working there, it was like anecdotal cases that somebody in Karachi had been diagnosed with HIV or there was um, a, you know, a, a migrant worker from China that had been diagnosed. But I think it's safe to say that the early stages of the outbreak were extremely sort of um, highly um, founded on only a limited number of introduction events. So. The average person who injects drugs in Pakistan, uh, it's almost predominantly male. Um, the, uh, with limited uh, formal education and, and uh, exposure to high risk, I guess, injection practices. One of the ones I guess just highlighting here is this uh, event that's going on in the background is there's actually a significant reporting of professional injectors or what they refer to as street doctors, and this is individuals that basically um, make a living or feed their own drug habits by injecting drugs into, um, into other people who are either inexperienced or for other reasons aren't able to inject. So the, the project itself is a five-year capacity building project. It's gone on for far longer than that now. <clears throat> to develop an integrated behavioral and biological surveillance system in Canada. My job was really to try to build a national laboratory capacity for supporting um, surveillance activities. Uh, as close as we got, we never got there altogether. Uh, the Ministry of Health was uh, basically devolved at, at the conclusion of the project, so uh, they still don't have a national laboratory system, so to speak. But what it was is it was four, at that time it was four rounds of surveillance that we would conduct in, in up to 12 cities in the four different provinces, looking at at-risk populations, either female sex workers, male sex workers, or hijra, or, or, or transgender sex workers, as well as intravenous drug users. And again, this gets back to the methodology we would, we as a group, would map the populations uh, using key informants to look for population size distribution and, and operational typology, and then proceed with integrative behavior and biological surveillance where you would, based on the understanding from your mapping, would try to get as representative a sample from that particular urban center uh, and collect dry blood spots, which then could be sent for when uh, most of the serology testing was actually done with partners in Pakistan, with the bioinformatics being sent to a uh, component being done by ourselves in, in, uh, at then Winnipeg, or then Ottawa, but now Winnipeg. So this is, again, just sort of trying to highlight where these activities took place. And so Pakistan, you know, its sort of north-south axis runs along uh, the Indus River Valley. So a lot of these communities sort of stretch from the Indus River, um, uh, the port city of Karachi, up the Indus River Valley, uh, up into the north. Um, and this sort of would represent what would be, this was round four, so it would be a, a round of surveillance that we did in 2011 looking at uh, mapping populations of intravenous drug users in, I think it's more than 12 centers there, it's probably 13 or 14 centers, um, understanding, sort of getting a census of the number of intravenous drug users in the, in the urban center and the number of locations where they would actually be injecting. And the reason I bring this up is because the math gets a little bit screwy here. So it's, again, it's just sort of a disclosure. So if we went in to collect 400 intravenous drug users from um, Hyderabad, right here, we'd be collecting about 10% of the population that uses intravenous, uh, that injects drugs in that population, whereas if we were going into Multan, we'd be collecting probably closer to half of the population. So the representativeness changes based on the, 
the um, average number of IDUs. Collectively, we, you know, if you look at the overall study, of the 46,000 people that were sort of mapped into the study, we, did, we tested 10% of them. And so this is the prevalence data. So during the last decade, uh, we've been seeing a, an increase within the sex worker populations, primarily the hedra sex worker population. But we've been seeing a uh, progressive and, and times dramatic increase in the prevalence of HIV amongst uh, people who inject drugs. So that's starting, in, again, at the start of the study at around 10%, expanding up to over 35% in uh, 2009 and 10. And this is a little bit misleading because it actually doesn't quite, the, the, what's driving this isn't necessarily a, an increase in Pakistan, but it's it increases in very, very dramatic increases that occur in certain urban centers. And so here I've just picked four of them. We have Lahore, Fazlabai, Karachi, which is, again, the biggest city in, in Pakistan. And you see there's increases, but they're relatively small, whereas in the city of Sargoda, we see a rise from, I think it was 9% in 2005 to over 50% 10 months later. So the explanation that was given to us at the time was, and partially this is maybe true, is that it's because Sargoda is, a, is an agricultural community, and during the time that we were doing the sampling, there was an influx of migrant laborers that were, interve that were intervening as drug users and infected with HIV. However, when we, and this is very, very remedial type of phylogenetics, when we looked at the samples from that population, 95% um, of them clustered with A1, but more significantly, 95% of them formed a single monophyletic cluster, which wouldn't be what you'd suspect if it was populations moving in. It would be what you'd suspect if there was activity and transmissions going on internally. So 30% of the individuals within that cluster actually report it not engaging in behaviors that we understood as uh, strong correlates of HIV infection, um, but the fact that they share a common virus would suggest that uh, there is either something going on that we don't know about or that they just simply just don't understand what risk behaviors actually are. So what we found was when we looked at a, and this gets back to the street doctors, Sargoda, and again this is Sargoda right here, at that period of time had a significant use of street doctors in, in the city. And more importantly, it wasn't just individuals helping to inject drugs, but it was actually a practice that was referred to as scale where a new intravenous drug user may procure drugs or may purchase drugs from the street doctor, but the street doctor would be responsible for mixing up the drugs and then double pumping the syringe and drawing blood out of the individual and, and then basically giving back a portion of that and retaining a portion which is referred to as scale, which you would then sell to somebody else. And so you can picture how that would, could, could be responsible for a very rapid increase in the um, expansion of HIV that we saw in that population during, um, during that time period. Incidentally, we've done a more recent study that looked at as one of the questions looked at the use of uh, street doctors or uh, had assisted injection practices, and we actually found that now there's a negative correlation that if somebody got used a street doctor, they were less likely to be HIV infected, and if they were less likely to be if they were HIV infected, they were less likely to be clustered with another infection. And the reason for that is these this population, this street doctor population, was actually being employed as part of a harm reduction strategy, so that they were the ones picking up clean syringes, and they were the ones that were responsible in giving messages about safe injection. So it shows some, um, you know, I, I think it's sort of a novel approach to getting ahead of the curve on, on intravenous um, transmission of HIV and intravenous drug using populations. So I'm going to reduce something down, and I hope it's not an insulting level, but it's more to introduce a, a method that we have than to actually preach to people. I'm sure they're aware of this. But looking at trans transmission dynamics within and be between risk populations. So um, again, this HIV epidemic is largely concentrated within the IDU population. We know that there's overlap between sex work and intravenous drug use, and so there's a potential for the, the epidemics to start to overlap. Um, and we also know that the intravenous drug using population is highly migratory within the, within the country. And so trying to understand that would require some new, um, new methods. And so if you look at a population, and again, since this is what I'm saying, I don't mean to insult, but if you look at a population, you say I have a, uh, a prevalence of infection of 50%, so you got 50% 50, 50 HIV negative, 50% HIV positive. There's a couple of different ways you can look at that when you look at the prevalence of transmission. There could be a 
very low prevalence of transmission. In other words, only four transmission events occurred within that population, which is a bit of a good news public health story because it says your population isn't being affected because of local transmissions. It's being, it's, the prevalence is, it was driven by something else as opposed to you know, an event such as this where you have multiple transmission events which says, you know, the fact that I have a prevalence of, of 50% is because I couldn't get ahead of the transmissions. So we just needed some type of bioinformatics tool that could generate a plot such as this. And luckily there's lots of really smart bioinformaticians around the world. Um, and so we collaborated with an individual in um, University of California, Joel Wertheimer. And he developed a tool which um, I, you know, I think unfortunately is called HIV Trace because it brings in all different types of connotations around what the tool is able to do. But it, um, what he was able to do is take the genetic data that we acquired during the uh, round four surveillance and I, offhand, I can't remember the numbers, but it's, it's probably around 60% of the samples that we were able to sequence from clustered with other samples in, in Pakistan. And I think some of the, what this highlights is if you look at, you know, your map over here, you'll see, you'll see things like this. You'll see like clusters that are almost purely, in this case, it's a, a location called DGCon, or uh, DGCon, which is located somewhere in there, right there. Um, which it seems to be a lot of internal transmissions going on, or you'll see patterns such as this where you've got um, significant overlap between, actually it's not that one, it's this one right here, significant overlap between um, Multan and, um, and Sargoda. And so Multan and Sargoda are, there's, uh, Sargoda's right there, and Multan's right here. And the same thing is you see these overlaps between Faslabad and Lahore as well. The other thing that you can identify in this type of analysis is that uh, not only do you have sort of localized networks and, and networks that sort of span particular, um, it's relatively like, tight geography, but you also have networks that span different risk behaviors as well. So you, you might have, like this is a network of men who have sex with men who's linked up with a heterosex worker. Um, here you have IV dr drug users which are overlap significantly with heterosex workers. And uh, somewhere in here, there's a female sex worker network. I'm not sure where it is, but um, any case, so it's just to sort of highlight the dynamics of, of what's going on in these populations and the way bioinformatics can give us a better understanding of the outbreak that we would see in any one urban center, maybe because of internal events in that geography, or it may be because of events going on between uh, two, different, two different urban centers. So, and actually, let me just go back here. I just want to point out this one city here. It's called Turbat, which is over in far east, uh, far western Baluchistan. We did we, in this population, we only sampled intravenous drug users. Um, so if you look at the percent of clustering uh, with any one of these urban centers, it's you know ranges from almost 80% of the infections are linked to some other infection, which again I think is an indication of perhaps an overwhelmed um, or insufficient public health response down to 7% in Turbat. And if you do compare this to Karachi in sort of an odds ratio approach, you're seven times more likely to be part of a network in Bhutan than you are in Karachi and virtually no, there's, Turbat is basically unlinked. But if you look at prevalence, Turbat is 21%, you know, not far off from what we're seeing in some of the other urban centers which have much, like Multan, which has much more significant clustering. So, and I think this is sort of pointing to one of the limitations in the analysis we do. I think it, in my mind, intuitively, I would not expect an isolated population in one of the most conservative parts of Pakistan to be, um, well, intuitively, I would think that it may have limited overlap with other urban centers in Pakistan, but I would also suspect that in that particular community we'll find significant overlap with Pashtun communities in, in Afghanistan. We've done a little bit of that, not with the A1 epidemic, but with one of the circulating recombinant forms, and that's exactly what we're finding, is that the founding effects that we're seeing in Pakistan is actually being driven by Afghan refugees that, are, that have moved into Pakistan because of the war. So again, this is sort of the interaction between risk groups, and this comes from our our last round of surveillance, and just to highlight that, you know, three over three percent of hydra sex workers identify as as, as uh, intravenous drug users, as also intravenous drug users. Ten percent of hydra sex workers have had sex with an intravenous drug user in the last six months, and this overlap sort of spans all of the risk populations. So, if you look at the frequency of potential transmissions 
uh, transmission partners by risk group, you find that intravenous drug users almost always are transmitting with other intravenous drug users, whereas in the case of hedra sex workers, it's sort of not evenly split, but much more uh, split between intravenous drug use and hedra sex work. So part of that, I think, is really because of the fact that the drug using population and the structure, the social structure of how hedra sex workers operate probably facilitates intravenous drug use within that population. The female sex workers is intriguing, but the, the N is so low it's meaningless. So again, uh, and this gets into sort of some bioinformatics that are a little bit more cutting edge. Results have shown the formation of a type monophyletic group that was believed to be founded by a founder event. Um, and uh, it was predominantly A1. And this was early on in the epidemic. A lot of this was being done in around 2005 to 2010. We've more recently done, a, a, and this was probably about two years ago, did an exclusive, and again, it was an integrated behavioral biological surveillance program looking exclusively at intravenous drug users, but only in five communities in Pakistan. And so what we found is, you know, true to form, the, 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 the epidemic remains to be predominantly A1, but we are seeing the introduction of other variants within this population. And again, in the case of the circu AD circulating recombinant form, we have an indication that this is probably linked to the migration of people from either from Iran or into, or into, um, into Afghanistan, or for either in Iran through Afghanistan, but into Pakistan. And, you know, again, this is a cluster diagram, about 56% of the individuals that we sampled in this particular round of surveillance in these five different cities. And again, just as a reference point, Kuwait is in Baluchistan, Peshawar is in, is in KPK. These are the very conservative parts of Pakistan. Uh, Hyderabad, Karachi, Larkana are actually located in the, um, in Sint, in the, in more in the Indus Valley region and sort of, again, in the more, I'm trying to think of, the more, I don't want to call it liberal, but not in the conservative part of Pakistan. So what we were able to do is we could use a coalescence approach in terms of how the genetic data could be interpreted to better understand migration patterns of HIV-infected IV drug users, but that's really a proxy for the migration patterns of intravenous drug users with, within the population. And I have to admit that a lot of this stuff for myself starts to enter into the world of black arts but it seems to work. And what they identified is that although Karachi may have been the, fa the center where the epidemic was founded, it appears that Larkana was actually similar to the story which happened with, uh, in um, Harold Jaffe's paper on New York. Larkana was the amplifier. It was the, it was the place where the infections basically amplified and then were dispersed out across the country. Um, so this was all done purely off of sort of this a number, uh, off of sequences that were collected in 2012 and 13 from these various cities. But interestingly enough, and this is with a colleague that we had in, um, at what, that we have with the National AIDS Control Program, Larkana was actually identified as the hub for intravenous drug use back in 2008. And again, this was not using any type of bioinformatics approach. This was basically being driven off of reporting that was coming out of the Integrated Behavioral and Biological Surveillance. So it's, it's Again, it's intriguing to see how the genetic data that this sort of this, in, this genetic signature that's left within the population of HIV-infected individuals um, can somehow or other be traced back and, and can verify what the behavioral surveillance is actually identifying. I'll, I'll skip this one because I, I sort of mentioned it earlier about the circulating recombinant forms movement. Um, and I guess one other approach that we've applied on the same data set, so this is the 2013 12, 13, 14 data that we acquired from those five cities is we were able to look at what's called the effective population size. So we use a, a this, this is called a Bayesian skyline um, and out reconstruction. And it's run out of a tool that we have in the laboratory, a uh, bio bioinformatics tool called BEAST. Uh, but what it's able to do is take genetic sequences and basically track back in time what the signature in the sequences tells us about the size of the population at a time. And again, this is like black art for me, but it works. And a lot of people doing this are using it to look at, um, you know, mammalian paleontology to show that, you know, the historic record of particular bottlenecks in population is actually still hidden in the genetic information that's re that, they, that they can harvest from a mastodon tooth. And so, they, it, it, and we don't know if this is true or not, but it's, 
I'm putting it up here just sort of to show how this method can generate hypotheses, is we know from our surveillance tools that we do see these sort of episodic rises in prevalence that occur in the population, and they more or less agree with what we see with, this, uh, with the Bayesian skyline reconstruction, that somewhere around 2005 to 7, we saw a, a rapid increase. After that, it somewhat stabilized, and then more recently, there's been another increase in the population. What this is overlaid on is actually opium cultivation in neighboring, um, neighboring Afghanistan. So Afghanistan is responsible for the cultivation of, I think, upwards to 80% of the world's opium. About half of that gets transported through the Indus Valley. And what we're speculating, if this is true at all, uh, is that it may be an indication that at times that there is sort of a, an influx of a lot of cheap um, heroin and other um, materials that are, recu uh, that, are re that are required for its production that you see spikes in, in um, the prevalence of, of HIV, uh, spikes in the effective population size of people infected with HIV. So again, just to skip through the, uh, these concluding remarks, it seems like unsafe, unsafe injection behavior plays a significant role in driving the rise of HIV prevalence, but local trends in opioid trafficking may influence injection behaviors to facilitate the transmissions. And that, I think that sort of um, translates that if you can understand, if this is true, and again, it's only hypothesis generating, but if it's true, then understanding the drug trade in Pakistan can also help you anticipate when there could be um, HIV outbreaks in Pakistan. And the other one is that uh, although there was a northward spread from Karachi, the amplifications actually were occurring in other, or other urban centers in Pakistan. So this is an acknowledgement for the Pakistan portion of the presentation and just a couple of people to, to highlight her. Uh, Frank Shalette, who does most of my bioinformatics, smart young guy. And then my uh, group that's in Pakistan, particularly uh, Nadeem Ikram, I, he's actually in um, Saudi now, but, uh, and Oshin Dar, who's my lab manager in Pakistan for doing, I, I think they just did an exceptional job dealing with that, what I've said was a relatively technical, simple part, but really hard to operational part about collecting, shipping, and storing of, of, um, of specimens. They're associated with these very large studies where we're collecting thousands and thousands of specimens. So let's skip over to uh, the work that we're doing in Ukraine. Um, so we're looking at a study, and, and this is with others as well, but we're looking at a study in a, uh, in a, a city called Dnipro, which I believe is Pakistan, oh, sorry, I'm gonna get my mind off Pakistan here for a second. Is the, I think it's Ukraine's uh, fourth largest city. Uh, significantly though, it's located about 200 kilometers um, away from the conflict zone that we hear so much about with uh, Russian support at militia in the area. And so the, the study is really to try to understand the early HIV risk of young women as they transition from sexual debut to casual sex to transactual sex and for some into formal sex work and to understand what are the risks associated with the transition period as, as the young women move through that as well as the access gap, which exists where once a young woman identifies herself as being a sex worker, there's a gap of time before she actually engages with prevention services. And so, um, you know, the, the, the bioinformatics tools that we're sort of trying to employ here is to have a better understanding, and this is not just HIV, but also hepatitis C, about what is happening within this, within this uh, population of young women. So it's to describe how the characteristics and length of the transition period and access period varies across different epidemiological contexts. And I'm not going to mention it here, but we're doing a sister study in Mombasa, Kenya, um, which we have some data on, but it's not ready to be presented. Uh, and to understand how, you know, where the risk exists, where women are getting infected, and, and um, whether or not there is justification to uh, move to targeted intervention into, uh, not, into not just into the female sex working population where it's available, but also into the transactional period and possibly other periods, I suppose, uh, casual period. Um, is, uh, we'll get to that in a moment as well around, around um, HIV and hepatitis C infections that are occurring in these populations. So um, again, there's your mapping and enumeration of, of spots and operational typology which occurs within those spots. The demographics of the women that we're looking at age-wise was 14 to 24 years of age. The groups were first sex, but not having engaged in transactional or formal sex work. Transactional sex is defined by not a pre-negotiation of 
of material or monetary return. Um, and then full-fledged sex work where women uh, basically will do negotiate in advance of, um, of the activity. And this is, again, self-identification within these groups. Uh, and some of the information that we're collecting in these populations were types and numbers of sex partners. And a lot of this analysis we haven't done yet in terms of how it relates back to the, the bioinformatics piece, which I'll be presenting. Types and frequencies of sex acts, condom use, Injection drug use, which is again really relevant for a lot of the um, transmission events that we'll be looking at. Violence, uh, we've actually extended the study. The initial study is called Transitions. We're studying a new study, uh, which is called Dynamics, which is looking at the impact of conflict on, on women entering into sex work. Um, and then reproductive health services and use of reproductive health services. And again, the, the, the sampling that we did, 1,800 women, 14, 24 years old, roughly broken into 900 casual and 450 each for uh, transactional and female sex workers. So what we found, and this was a little bit surprising, but I think we have an explanation for it. So when the study was being done, uh, the belief on the ground in Ukraine was that there was very little hepatitis C within the population, very little HIV in the population. Uh, a lot of it was being done through um, uh, point of care rapid tests. There may have been a problem there. Uh, we don't know that for sure. Uh, but we think there may be a timing issue that's gone on. And it, again, this is sort of the hypothesis generating piece that, that we're able to use bioinformatics to, to at least glean some understanding of what may, may be happening. Interestingly, within the female sex working population, you have 30% of that population is hepatitis C infected. There's, there's close to 10% um, I guess it is 10% that are HIV infected. Interestingly though, the majority of the HIV infected individuals are also hepatitis C infected in that, in that particular population. Subtype distribution, again, sort of like the high level bioinformatics. This is information that we had to sort of pull from a publicly available database and it's extremely limited. And again, this is a little bit to do with what I said earlier about getting the proper information into bioinformatics tools. It looks like, yes, the majority of Ukraine is an A-type um, outbreak of HIV uh, with a, a smattering of B, sort of the opposite to what we have in North America. The transition study, uh, the women were almost exclusively, well, were exclusively infected with an A-type virus. And get, the story gets a little bit more interesting as well. Hepatitis C, NEPRO, there was some data on hepatitis C in the population, predominantly 1B. There's um, a smaller proportion, around 30%, that are 3A. Our study in transitions showed more or less the same thing, although the, the numbers are, are reversed. Um, and again, that just sort of spills out similarly to the various risk groups for casual female and transactional sex work. So this gets to phylogenetic clustering. Um, so the typologies that we were looking at are brothel, street, cafe, restaurant, massage, and apartment. Of course, brothel will only apply to female sex workers. Similarly, massage parlor is, uh, a, is an area where the person would be sampled, but quite often they, that may be a brothel-based sex worker. So what we found is that the vast majority of the HIV-infected individuals, if you're HIV-infected within that population of the three groups of women, um, you, form, you fall within pretty much a single transmission cluster. I think what's interesting about this is you see sort of within this like, like balloon cloud that we have up here, you have a mix of both operational typologies, but you also have a mix of casual as well as sex work within, within the, that group. But it's linked up to a smaller group of female sex workers. And what distinguishes these female sex workers is they're actually ones that they share HIV with the other group. So in other words, they, they have the same HIV, but they also are, double, are dual infected with hepatitis C as well. Um, I, I won't worry about the panel on the right because that's just simply age distribution. Okay, so this is looking at drug use, and I think we've identified a little glitch that we may have in here that's going to have, we're, we're going to Ukraine um, in two days to try to resolve some of the problems that we may be pulled out of this, but we asked two questions, ever used drug or ever injected drugs, and as a whole, the population, as a whole, like for the group that we're looking at, drug use was, was relatively, um, reported injecting drug use was low, at, well, it's, it's about 10%, I think, within the population as a whole. Um, and part of that may be driven by the fact that um, female sex workers, if they want to stay in female sex work, they need to not be taking drugs. It's a quick way to end up outside the brothel. 
But one of the glitches I think we've identified here, and this is again for disclosure, is that it almost appears that the question may not have been understood clearly by the people operationalizing the program on the ground because you have questions of ever used drugs and you have, for example, this individual here that says, yes, I've used drugs in the past, but then they were never ever asked whether or not they ever injected drugs. So we can't say for sure that this is a true representation of the fact that there's very little drug use, in injection drug use within that population. But I do find it interesting that you have this sort of highly tethered, high, what I would imagine to be a much more high risk population um, that's linked to casual sex workers um, operating, I guess, in, in similar venues. Hepatitis C gets to be a little bit more complicated. Um, rather than a single, mono, a single or monophyletic cluster like we have in HIV and a, and a handful of dyads, you see a lot of um, hepatitis C clusters within this population. And some, again, sort of span different um, it, it span casual sex work and transactional sex work. In this case here, you have this group of casual and transactional sex work, that, uh, sorry, not sex work, casual and transactional sex, which is largely street-based, linked up to um, uh, brothel-based uh, uh, sex workers. Um, and, and again, you have this sort of this mixture of typology between uh, d different different venues as well as, as, well as the, uh, the different groups of women. But you also find this, you find that you have these clusters that they're, they're sort of highly dense clusters of transmission that all share the exact same hepatitis C, but are also HIV infected as well. And if you just do that, haven't, we haven't gone back and tried to sort of interface the HIV piece with the hepatitis C piece to say whether or not what proportion are sharing the same virus. But just by the numbers alone, you can sort of see that they're sharing the same HIV, probably a portion of them share the same hepatitis, or sorry, they're sharing the same hepatitis C, and probably a portion of them share the same HIV as well. But they're obviously just based on what we saw in terms of the sheer number of co-infections when we looked at HIV. These are, HI, these are other HIV infections occurring uh, within, within that population. And if, we, again, we go with the drug use, it does look, you know, again, I, I don't know what to make of the injection drug use piece, but it does look like when you achieve a certain density of intravenous drug users within your network, that's the point at which you start to see these dual infections. Looks like about 50% or greater. Incidentally, this group down here is a group of sex workers, which there's four of them, two of which report intravenous, well, report drug use, one of which reports intravenous drug use. Don't know about the other one. These are individuals that are actually HIV infected and then duly infected with hepatitis as well. So they have, uh, they have both of the circulating forms of hepatitis in, in, that pot, in, in that group. Okay, so this gets to the last part of my presentation, which I guess I'm doing okay for time. Um, so we've largely ditched the old ABI Sanger sequencing technology in our laboratory. Um, it's, it's next generation generates much more information and, it, and it's cheaper, easier to run. Uh, so just as a reference, so next generation sequencing is sort of like this whole exome sequencing technology that allows you to look like over vast amount of, of human genomic data to understand sort of the, the blueprint that makes us us. We applied it in a different way. Rather than sort of the breadth of sequencing, we're working with a relatively small genome of 10,000 base pairs. So we're actually looking at depth of sequencing and we're using it to try to extract from the extract from individuals as much information about the circulating quasi-species that exists within that population. And, and the reason for doing that, I'll, I'll get to in a moment. But um, just simply to say that we, you know, re we can reliably get, for any particular genetic region, thousands of reads of coverage, of good coverage, uh, good sequencing coverage for any, for any 200 base pairs that we, we want to look at. So this is uh, just sort of measuring the accumulation of mutations over time. This is a cartoon on, on the left that I think most of us have seen before that most infections start clonally and then over multiple cycles of replication start to accumulate ever-expanding quasi-species, which more or less circulate around this sort of dominant viral genome that exists. This is actually some work from our laboratory where we're, and it's non-human primate work, looking at um, a, a, so we took a laboratory clone of SIV, MAC239, and using 
um, low-dose intervaginal challenge of the non-human primates were able to infect the animals. And what, this, what we're looking at here is through next generation sequencing, looking at the fixation of mutations that occur, and I, I'm not sure which region of the gene this is, but it, it occurs in all regions, all, all reading frames within, the, within SIV, and I imagine within HIV as well. But we see sort of this orderly accumulation of, of single nucleotide polymorphisms as they become fixed as the dominant variant that occurs. And this, again, it appears to occur very orderly over time. And again, this is a matter of weeks, going from 10 to 40 weeks. So it implies that the accumulation of, of these mutations over time can be used to sort of fix roughly the time of infection. And this is some work that was done by our colleagues in, uh, at BC Richard Harrigan and Jeff Joy looking, this is in case of hepatitis C, but looking at single nucleotide variants in hepatitis C from zero to six months up to three years, and you see this sort of increase in the uh, single nucleotide variant counts that occurs as, the, as time progresses. So what, we've, what we're doing is taking a time to most recent common ancestor estimate using this um, um, Bayesian approach, again, within a tool called BEAST, so what we can do is we can take, like again, we have thousands and thousands of reads of coverage. We can take our highest quality reads and then basically build a tree to, to most recent common ancestor. This tree that I extracted and show here is a female sex worker who's 18 years old who first reported sex at 14 years. We don't know if it, you know, we don't know if the calibration is bang on on this, but it gives us some estimate of the time time at which the individual may have been infected. And we find that interesting because this gets back to maybe what was going on, why they weren't seeing hepatitis in earlier, time, earlier studies a couple of years ago in the population is we're pretty confident with the hepatitis work. It's been published, the calibration we know about, HIV work. We maybe have to work, work out some of the glitches still, but I think it's showing a couple of things. Number one, it looks like something happened in NEPRO in the last year to two years that somehow or other facilitated the acquisition of, of hepatitis C within, within these populations. And again, it didn't matter whether you're a female sex worker, or a transactional sex worker, or casual sex, or had casual sex. It, your infection seemed to date back to about a year or two ago. Possibly, and the, although conflict isn't necessarily a risk, a risk behavior, it does, it does support an environment which can support risk behavior. So that sort of coincides with the outbreak of conflict in the region. And again, we don't know if it's true, it's just a hypothesis. The issue with female sex workers, or sorry, women engaging in either casual transactional or female sex work, is that the HIV infections within the, it, it looks as though if you get infected with HIV, and again, the caveat is here is that we're working on the calibration, so we, we know that some things are a little bit wonky here, but it looks like the infections with HIV occur relatively quickly during the casual and transactional phase. And again, these are infections within female sex workers that are occurring, and we know 30 years in a person who's 24 years old isn't real, um, but it appears that it's occurring sometime further back and possibly during the transactional or casual period when, when these female sex workers were, were, you know, from sexual debut moving through casual and transactional sex. This one female sex worker where the, it looks like it's about two years old, is actually probably one of the younger sex workers that we sample. I think she's 17 or 18 years old. So the colors didn't work on this. This is my last slide. Um, but what this would show, and you have to picture the colors here, is that the uh, age of last birthday would be a purple dot, and it would be this, these dots right here, the ones that are sort of the furthest out. The age um, of first sex would be a blue dot, and would predominantly be these la the ta tailing dots. And then the age inferred by the time to most recent common ancestor would be a sometime in between. So what we're and we, we're, they are, we've actually done more individuals than this right now. Um, I'm only showing two of each group. Um, but what it, again, what it looks like is, and this is for HIV, it looks like the infections are occurring sometime <coughs> within the last two years, except for female sex workers, where the, the infections may be occurring um, much farther back. And again, this actually is the, in this particular individual, this is actually the um, time to most recent common ancestor. So, I mean, it, it's possible that she was she was infected through some other route um, prior to actually uh, engaging in first sex. 
it's also quite possible, well, certainly the error bars have probably overlapped that, but it's also possible that we have work to do in terms of calibrating uh, the instrument. So HIV and hepatitis, so this is concluding remarks, HIV and hepatitis C phylogenetic clusters highlight the complex social networking. There's a mixing between various spot typologies and age groups. Again, this may be driven by the fact that female sex workers are highly mobile, they move between brothels. It appears that female sex workers have older infection, um, that HIV is closer to the time of sexual de debut. Um, and again, I think if, if this holds true, it probably is an indication that this, this transition period is, is a period of vulnerability for, for uh, young women in terms of acquiring HIV and hepatitis C. Um, and I guess that's about it. Let's see. Uh, yeah, I, well, I guess one other thing that we're working on again is that because if it holds true that there's not a lot of intravenous drug use within this population, if it holds true that these infections probably happened within the last two years, and the reason we're confident around that is because, again, the reports on the ground was is that they did not believe there's a lot of hepatitis C circulating in those populations a couple of years ago, then it may indicate that there's some other driver that's, that's present. The ones that we're operating on right now is there's a very large and unregulated tattooing industry that exists in the population so that, you know, apparently there's not a, a lot of autoclaves um, in, the, in places where people go, go get tattoos and there's a number of activities associated with tattooing. So we're thinking that maybe that might be part of what's driving the uh, hepatitis C um, outbreaks because it's multiple outbreaks in, in, uh, in the Ukraine. So this is just to acknowledge uh, the many groups, and unfortunately we weren't able to pull together a listing of the many names that are associated with, with the, uh, the Ukraine project. So I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, great talk, thanks. I'm Yashin from DHAPS. I have a question about um, the infection times that can be inferred from the phylogenetic data analysis. I wonder in your field experience, have you tried to kind of validate the infection time that infer from the phylogenetic data with the field data that you collected through the interviews? Yeah, so yes and no. We published a paper you quite a few years ago where we actually, and it was like, I mean, this was like, like um, th this was bioinformatics in the days of Neanderthal bioinformatics that we were doing, is we were looking at, uh, we, had, we had sort of well-constructed um, serial conversion panels that we were using as part of sort of validation of other recency assays that we were working with. And we were basically going back and looking at the emergence of minor variants, but it was based on, uh, on um, chromatograms, and we, we we could see a correlation between that. That as people progressed, you could start to see minor variants appear. So I would suspect you know, we we need to go back and do that. Definitely, we need to go back and do that with HIV. It has been validated um, by others for hepatitis C. Great, that was a very interesting talk. I uh, have two questions. The first relates to um, some of the latter pieces you're presenting on. Uh, the, the time to most recent ancestor. And so it has to do with the ART like treatment landscape in Ukraine. Um, so do you think that treatment would perturb the, that sort of relationship? Because I, my intuition would say if there's treatment, you might see more uh, nodes that would be there, but they're driven to extinction within the host. So then maybe the calculation might get might get off. Yeah, I absolutely. I think that that would be the case. Um, again, it's you know if you think about it, in order to get quasi species variation driven, you need to have replication. And in the absence of replication, I I could only because of drugs, I could only see it affecting. So so what is the treatment landscape in in this setting? Do you know? I do not oh, know. Yeah. And then uh, second, uh, I was interested in um, some of the the diagrams that you were drawing where. Uh, that there were there's very tight connections among female sex sex workers, uh, even though even among those who did not report any drug use. What do you think those ties mean? Because if they're not doing any, if they haven't done any drugs, it's not a it's not a drug tie. Yeah. So again, we're thinking 
But one of the things we have to make sure is that that reporting of, that's a self-reporting of drug use. There probably is a bias that women aren't going to necessarily come forward and say that they use intravenous drugs because, again, it's a surefire way of being, you know, ending up on the street rather than in the brothel. And, uh, but if that's true, again, we're thinking that it's maybe some other risk behavior that's associated with the groups and that we don't know what that may be. We, one of the things that we need to go back and look at, so there's a lot of spots that were mapped in this study. Only a subset of those spots were sampled. We know that some spots are much more overrepresented in, in these, these clusters. And so it could be anything from, um, let's say it's a, collection, a group of, of brothel-based sex workers that somehow or other overlap in terms of the brothels they work with. And again, these are sort of highly structured brothels that are tied to um, less desirable elements with criminal activity in the cities. But it's, it's possible that the, the women are engaging in, again, body piercing, tattooing, it could be sharing of razors, it could be a lot of things that may be, may be driving that, that, that hepatitis C, those, those, those tight clusters. Sorry, uh, one question. Did you consider, uh, because of, uh, you said that there was a connection between hepatitis C and the conflict, uh, the, the effect of uh, blood transfusion due to more trauma that is happening among soldiers and other population that we see in wars? Uh, I mean, that's, a, that's a great question. We're the, the, the next study that we're doing, the dynamic study, will probably, you tell me if it's possible, <laughs> the goal is to actually sample from clients as well. So it's not just to sample from the women, but to sample from clients. And I think that will also give us a new insight in sort of what, how, What's going on? In the, I imagine when you're saying blood transfusion, it's because of rebel or government forces getting blood transfusions and then them becoming the source of onward, onward infections within the sex work population, correct? Well, well yeah, I think like uh, the war in general gets more trauma. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, the, 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 for the soldiers and for the civilians, and the control is often not that good uh, for the, you know, hepatitis C and other uh, bloodborne diseases. So that, yeah. that might be. be yeah, so I think our, our hope is that the next study will probably be able to get more nuanced information around the clients and what may be driving infections within, within you know, a young soldier who possibly is, is attending a brothel and, and ends up infecting, infecting one or more sex workers within the brothel. But we don't know that yet. But it's, it's a good point. I mean, it's, it's very possible that that is one of the drivers. Do we have questions on the phone? So I, I have to say up front that I actually had a hard time sleeping last night because I was afraid that there was going to be bioinformaticians on here that were going to be able to pick me apart. <laughs> no, I, 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 no there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot to take in from this talk, and I didn't have enough time to take in fully one of the slides. I think it was like 29 or 30 in, in the, um, the, the Pakistan, where you were showing the density of contacts by different classes of people, so among female sex workers, mm -hmm. among men who have sex with women, and so forth. And so in, in particular, the, the, I think the far right column was the MSW column, and it was split among the different types of people that they could have contact with. The largest, the largest uh, component of that, I believe, was among MSW, and I didn't know what that meant. So uh, I, would, I would guess, again, this hypothesis generation, is that it, if you are a male sex worker and you get HIV infected from sex, it's it, it's sort of like it, it's being driven through the through male sex work and it's not being driven through intravenous drug use. So you'll have a client of the male sex worker is infecting multiple people, and that's why these individuals, the male sex workers, are are showing um, genetic clustering. I, I, I see now, yeah. My, my misunderstanding was just in the three-letter acronym that I, I thought you were talking about men who have sex with women. Oh, no, no. So, <laughs> no. Like, this is very peculiar. <laughs> I don't... No, no, it's, it's male sex workers. <laughs> oh, uh, bioinformatics question. <laughs> the 
Bayesian analyses and where you used uh, a strict molecular clock instead of a relaxed one. Did you compare your the the divergence times or time went between those types of analyses? Okay, so I'm going to say something, <laughs> <laughs> and if I'm right, you say, "Oh, okay." Okay. But if I if I made a fool of myself, just sort of go, "Hmm." Okay. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> My understanding, so a strict molecular clock, my understanding was is that uh, with a relaxed molecular clock, it simply can't find, the, the, the relatedness is so much that it can't actually, it doesn't fit a tree okay. in the end. And okay. so the, the, the thing just sort of grinds away and, until the computer's hard drive melts. And, and, that uh, sounds good to me. Okay. okay. Yeah. I just wanted to know if you, had, if you had looked at the differences, but that sounds great. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks everybody for attending, and again, it's uh, it's great to be back in Atlanta.